Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to explore North Sentinel Island, home to the Sentinelese or Sentinelli people, an indigenous people in voluntary isolation who protect themselves from the outside world, often with force. This place absolutely fascinates me, as you'll see it has fascinated many other people. After briefly gathering up some information for this episode, I was curious to find out when these people were discovered and if we've ever really been able to communicate with them. So let's start digging in a little deeper and see what we can uncover. Sentinel is one of the Andaman Islands, an archipelago in the Bay of Bengal. The island is forested aside from the shore, it's surrounded by coral reefs, and it has an area of about 23 square miles. The Indian boar seems to be native to the island and the people are hunter-gatherers. Very little is known about the island though, and it hasn't been well surveyed and has, by and large, remained a mystery. What we do know about the Sentinelese is that it's thought they live in three small bands with communal huts and temporary shelters, sometimes located on the beach with space for one nuclear family. The women wear fiber strings tied around their waist, necks, and heads. The men also wear necklaces and headbands, but a thicker waist belt, and they carry spears, bows, and arrows. As Survival International states, although commonly described in the media as Stone Age, this is clearly not true. There is no reason to believe the Sentinelese have been living in the same way for tens of thousands of years they are likely to have been in the Adamans. Their ways of life will have changed and adapted many times, like all peoples. For instance, they now use metal which has been washed up or which they have recovered from shipwrecks on the island reefs. The iron is sharpened and used to tip their arrows. From what can be seen from a distance, the Sentinelese islanders are clearly extremely healthy and thriving in marked contrast to the Great and Damanese tribes to whom the British attempted to bring civilization. The people who are seen on the shores of North Sentinel look proud, strong, and healthy, and at one time, observers have noted many children and pregnant women. Unfortunately, we're about to get into those attempts at civilization in a moment. Though Sentinel Island is isolated and largely untouched, the Andaman Islands as a whole, however, are not. The Andaman Islands, as well as North Sentinel, have been known for centuries. When Marco Polo passed through the area in the late 13th century, he described the Andamanese as a most brutish and savage race, having heads, eyes, and teeth like those of dogs. Though other sources say that historians believe he made those remarks based on hearsay and never actually visited the island himself. Regardless, in 1771, North Sentinel specifically was mentioned as an East India Company survey vessel passed through, observing the lights from fires on shore. Genetic studies of the contracted Adaman tribes indicate that they directly descend from modern humans who left Africa roughly 60,000 years ago. The Andamanese may have derived two to 3% of their genes from a yet identified hominin, other recent sources that have done testing on the topic claim that Andamanese have their nearest neighbor lineages in East Asia, and that these Indian populations have an incredibly complex ancestry. Some sources claim that it's very likely the Sentinelese came either from deliberate migration or as the result of a group drifting off course from the little island of Andaman where the Ongi live. Their canoes are built in a style reminiscent, though not identical to the Ongi as well. Many tribes existed along this archipelago when it was discovered, such as Akakari, Akakora, Akabo, Akajiru, and Apukawar, and several others along the largest island of Andaman. The Ongi tribe also existed on Little Andaman to the south. One source explains, Firstly, it should be made clear that the Andamanese tribes are not tribes in the way the term is normally understood is ethnological and anthropological literature. The Andamanese tribes had very little power structure. They had chiefs only in times of trouble. They had no tribally owned territory, no clans, and not much in the way of revered common tribal ancestors. Indeed, it is easier to define the tribes by what they are not rather than what they are or were. 
Basically, each Andamanese tribe is merely a collection of independent local groups that speak the same language, share a common culture and tradition, and are bound to each other by bonds of family and tradition. There is no tribal territory, only a number of hunting territories, each owned by a local group. The Andamanese were fully aware of the linguistic basis of their tribes. All greater Andaman tribal names come with the prefix Aka, Akar, A, or Oko. In the various tribal languages, these meant from the mouth or language. A member of the Akar Bael tribe, therefore someone coming from the tribe speaking the Bael language. The first outsiders to take interest in the Andamanese aren't aware of this, nor any subdivisions among them. So they were thought to be one large tribe, all speaking the same language. What was thought to be unpredictable in behavior, friendly one day and hostile the next, was simply different tribes' reactions to them. Confusion reigned for a while until this was understood. Although each language may be closely related to one another, the island was almost like a massive game of telephone for lack of a better term. The further away you got from a tribe, the more distant they became. The two languages at the extreme ends of the continuum, Akabia and Akakari, were unintelligible from each other, whereas geographical neighbors were similar. Very little is known too about the cultural differences between the 10 great Andamanese tribes. Best known from the writings of Man and Portman are the Akabia. Later researchers investigating the Northern tribes could only salvage what they could from groups that were close to dissolution. Radcliffe Brown, our major source for the Northern tribes was primarily interested in presenting his interpretation of the available evidence and only secondarily in the collection of new data. He tended to refer to the Northern tribes as a whole, showing more interest in what they had in common than what divided them. To the greater Andamanese themselves, their tribal differences, of course, loomed large and seemed enormously important until 1858, when truly different outsiders moved in. Today, all that is left of the great Andamanese is a tiny group of roughly two dozen people living on Straits Island Reservation with their material needs taken care of by Indian government social workers. As for what happened in the 1800s, well, this is where I'm going to start putting a massive trigger warning for the episode, because we're going to talk about some violence as well as tribes that were treated abusively and terribly, and well, it's gonna be really disturbing. According to Scientific American, the Andaman Islanders were feared by ancient mariners because they slew people who were shipwrecked on their shores. In 1858, repelling bows and arrows with gunfire, British officials established a penal colony on the Southern Andaman Island, now the town of Port Blair. Hey, that's my name. To pacify the hostile natives, the colonizers captured and held some in so-called Andaman homes. There they were piled with alcohol and other enticements to create artificial wants, in the words of one official, to satisfy which they would have to engage in peaceful intercourse with the superior race. Also at these homes, guards raped Andamanese women, injecting syphilis into a population that because of tens of millennia of isolation had no immunity to the germs that outsiders carry. Epidemics ravaged the great Andamanese comprising 10 tribes of the South, North and Middle Andaman Islands, slashing their numbers anywhere from 5,000 and 8,000 to a mere 19 in the 1960s. It's said that on May 17th, 1859, a battle broke out between the Great Andamanese tribe and the British. This was the Battle of Aberdeen when the Great Andamanese stormed the British post, but they were outnumbered and were slaughtered in the thousands. It's said that a man named Dudnath Tiwari, an escaped convict who lived among the Andamanese for a year, told the British about the tribe's plans. The Great Andamanese wanted to eliminate the outsiders from their land only to be massacred. I can't exactly blame these tribes for wanting to kill the British. I mean, colonizers invaded their homes, bringing disease and raping the women of the tribes. It isn't right what happened to them. I'm only summarizing here though, because there's still a lot more that happened to the Andamanese people, as well as Jawara, another indigenous peoples that lived by South Andaman Island and the Angi who lived in Little Andaman Island. As for North Sentinel, their island didn't escape notice either. In 1867, an Indian ship called Nineveh was wrecked on the beach. The 106 survivors set up a temporary camp, but they were attacked a few days later. If not for a Royal Navy steamer arriving shortly afterwards, it's unlikely they would have survived. Yet this was far from the only contact the Sentinelese people had with the outside world at that time. 
Maurice Vidal Portman, officer in charge of the Andamanese, went ashore in 1880 to search for natives. He found some villages and captured a woman with four small children. After a few days, he released her and one of the children with gifts. A few days later, his group found an old man with his wife and child and they captured them. The two adults, the man and his wife became ill and died. The four children were sent back home with presents and presumably germs that could infect the other villagers. Maurice recommended that the government convert North Sentinel to a coconut plantation and stated, search parties should go through the jungle and catch some of the male Sentinelese unhurt and should keep them in the camp. It's said that to make up for them getting sick, Portman would continue to leave the Sentinelese people gifts. But in February, 1895, when he returned to a lost Sentinelese who drifted off the island and ended up in the Onki tribe in Little Andaman, the tribe didn't welcome him and chased him off the island like they've been known to do. Again, who could blame them honestly? I'd be chasing him off too. Some blame Portman entirely for the tribe's mistrust and that Portman wasn't just studying these tribes for science, but that he was erotically obsessed with the Andamanese people. He would apparently kidnap members of various tribes and pose them in mock Greek homoerotic compositions and he cataloged their bodies with an obsessive focus on their genitals. A few sources have mentioned his disturbing acts by now, all of them largely blaming Portman for being the reason behind the incredibly intense hostility now. Just a year after Portman tried to return a lost Sentinelese, a Hindu convict fled from the main British penal colony on Great Andaman Island on a makeshift raft, landing on North Sentinel. Apparently, a few days later, his body was found pierced in several places by arrows with his throat cut. The message was clear, stay away from North Sentinel Island. There is actually one other encounter on North Sentinel Island regarding Portman that I found worth mentioning when, according to my source, Beginning at nine in the evening on the 26th of August, 1883, distant gunfire was heard at irregular intervals and this was interpreted as a distress signal of a ship. On the morning of the next day, the same portman went out in search for the troubled vessel in the area of Rutland Island, the Labyrinth Group and North Sentinel Island. He landed on the ladder, but only found deserted villages and no sign of a distressed vessel. The natives have melted away in the face of superior numbers and firepower. The landing party left gifts and then returned to Port Blair. The gunfire continued, streams dried up briefly and the sea receded and advanced several times in a most unusual way. Only when the telegrams arrived did it become clear to the bewildered officials at Port Blair what had happened. The gunfire was the final volcanic cataclysm of Krakatoa exploding 2,500 kilometers or 1,500 miles away near Java. And that's how loud Krakatoa was, that from 1500 miles away, Portman thought it was a ship in distress, though that was an entirely separate episode, but I just thought that was interesting. For years, the Sentinelese were left alone. In 1899, the chief commissioner of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands did tour the island trying to catch fugitives, but he discovered that they had all been killed and not much else is said of the encounter. However, in 1947, India gained independence, no longer under British rule. In 1956, a law was put in place that banned anyone from traveling within three nautical miles of the island, meant to protect the tribe from illnesses that they can't fight off. But after about a decade in 1967, India wanted to make contact with the Sentinelese again, and it was an anthropologist that got the job. In an interview with Economic Times, he said, "'It was January, 1967. I was then 31. I was in charge of the regional center of the Anthropological Survey of India in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. It was a joint venture of the Anthropological Survey of India and the Andaman Administration. The idea was to explore North Sentinel Island and make friends with the tribes there. About 20 of us, including local administrators, policemen, and naval personnel took a small ship. The Navy provided us landing gear. North Sentinel is a small island of about 20 square miles. In my estimate, there are 80 to 100 Sentinelese now. Other reports indicate there could be as few as 15 and as many as 500 Sentinelese, but the general consensus is between 80 to 150. Pandit continues, when we reached there, we had no idea that the locals could be hostile and attack us. We learned about that aspect of the Sentinelese only in our subsequent visits. On our first visit, the Sentinelese must have seen us, but they did not come out at all. Instead, they hid in forests, possibly observing us. There's a small beach in the island and the rest are all forest areas. So when we walked into the island, they were definitely watching us, but we did not see them. 
We first spotted a footmark and followed it to enter deep into the jungles. After walking in the forest for a kilometer or so, I saw an open area with 18 huts. Those were occupied, not abandoned ones. I noticed fire and cooked food items. We saw roasted fish, wild fruits. There were bows, arrows, and spears all around. There were half-made baskets too. They don't wear any clothes. They don't collect any stuff and keep it in their homes, but their houses were nicely built. We spent about an hour there. Personally, I was not keen on getting their stuff, but the policemen who went with us picked up bows, arrows, spears, etc. We kept some gifts there, coconuts, plastic utensils, aluminum, etc. We estimated that about 40 to 50 people must have been living in that colony. No one attacked us. According to Pandit, the Sendinalese aren't actually violent. They simply want to be left alone and only attack if bothered. This narrative does lend some credence to that. And as Pandit states, throughout the 70s and 80s, they developed a strategy for their visits. The Sentinelese would make various gestures like showing Pandit and the others their backs, maybe as an insult, we're not sure, but Pandit didn't walk around on the island anymore. They could understand these warnings, so they maintained a safe distance. And from a distance, they would give gifts like coconut, iron rods, utensils, etc. There have been a few other encounters for this time as well, some of which are less friendly. For example, in the spring of 1974, North Sentinel was visited by a film crew that was shooting a documentary titled Man in Search of Man, along with a few anthropologists, some armed policemen, and a photographer for National Geographic. In the words of one of the scientists, their plan was to win the natives' friendship by friendly gestures and plenty of gifts. As the team's motorized dinghy made its way through the reefs towards shore, some natives emerged from the woods. The anthropologists made friendly gestures. The Sentinelese responded with a hail of arrows. The dinghy proceeded to a landing spot out of arrow range where the policemen dressed in padded armor disembarked and laid gifts on the sand, a miniature plastic automobile, some coconuts, a tethered live pig, a child's doll, and some aluminum cookware. Then they returned to the dinghy and waited to observe the native's reaction to the gifts. The native's reaction was to fire more arrows, one of which hit the film director in the left thigh. The man who had shot the film director was observed laughing proudly and walking toward the shade of a tree where he sat down. Other natives were observed spearing the pig and the doll and burying them in the sand. They did, however, take the cookware and the coconuts with evident delight. In 1975, the exiled king of Belgium on a tour of the Andamans was brought by local dignitaries for an overnight cruise to the waters off North Sentinel. Mindful of lessons learned the year before, they kept the royal party out of arrow range, approaching just close enough for a Sentinelese warrior to aim his bow menacingly at the king, who expressed his profound satisfaction with the adventure. During another encounter on August 2nd, 1981, it said that a Panamanian freighter called the Primrose actually ran aground at North Sentinel and waited for help to arrive. A few days in, a sailor spotted people coming toward the freighter, a group of short but well-built men holding spears, bows, and arrows. They radioed asking for an immediate airdrop of firearms, though it does not seem like their request was fulfilled. Thankfully, they were rescued by helicopter almost two weeks after the ship wrecked and the Sentinelese scavenged the ship. Later expeditions found the Sentinelese using tools that may have been fashioned from the ship's remains. The ship can still be seen on Google Maps today. A local shipbreaking company was permitted to scavenge some of these remains as well. Five brothers that worked as shipbreakers went to the island with a police escort every few months until 1997. One apparently found a Sentinelese bow floating in the water and took it home, but otherwise it doesn't seem like they had much contact. At least none seems to be listed. Yet it was because of Pandit's efforts in 1991 for the first time ever, the Sentinelese made genuine positive contact and took coconuts from Pandit and his team's hands. They still didn't allow anyone inside the island and they were angered at the sight of other indigenous peoples such as the Ongis with Pandit's team, but this was a massive step forward. It's said that this repeated gift giving was successful enough that after the mid nineties, the Sentinelese people allowed visitors on their beaches and gifts could be handed over with actual physical touching. Though it seems the scientists were the only ones saying, hey, maybe don't do that because you can spread disease, but visitors didn't seem concerned with that. However, the Jararo crisis in late 1997 grounded this supposed friendship campaign. The Jararo people who live in the South and Middle Andaman Island were encouraged to come out of their forest seclusion and as a result began upsetting locals. They would wander naked into villages, take whatever they wished, become prey to sexual exploitation and measles, creating a massive headache for authorities. 
CBS states that they even stormed a police outpost and killed a guard with arrows, though relations have begun improving again. Massive papers have been written on the Jarawa people and why this attitude came to be, but needless to say, after the Jarawa crisis, the government wasn't quite as keen on being close to the Sentinelese. Although contact was back to back to being at minimal level for a while, the mid 2000s saw some activity again. In 2004, after the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, the Indian government flew helicopters over the Andaman Islands to see how the communities were affected. Insider reports that the Sentinelese were largely unaffected, while other sources say that in the long run, we can't be sure that things will remain unchanged as some coral reefs have sunk, others have been raised, and it's hard to estimate the damage to their fishing grounds. Still, overall, the Sentinelese don't seem to have suffered, judging from how one warrior shot arrows at the helicopter while others threw rocks at it. A couple years later, the Sentinelese were making news again when in 2006, two fishermen inadvertently washed up on the island and lost control of their boat. Other sources claim that this was intentional and the two men, Sundar Raj and Pandit Tiari, slept overnight in their boat by the island. The Sentinelese reportedly killed them and buried them off the beach. Efforts to reach the island were obviously resisted and thus were never successful. Another source says differently and reports the two men did not respond to warning calls from other fishermen and ended up in the shallow waters near the island where a group of Sentinelese attacked the fishermen and hacked them both to death with axes. It is reported that their bodies were placed on bamboo stakes facing out to the sea like scarecrows. Three days later, the Indian Coast Guard helicopter discovered their bodies and while trying to retrieve them, came under fire once again from armed islanders with arrows. The mission was abandoned shortly after. Regardless of how their bodies were treated, again, the message was loud and clear. Do not bother North Sentinel Island. I understand that Pandit had some success there and he claims they don't instigate violence, but it really doesn't seem like it was wise to go there considering the history of the place and how they may justifiably mistrust outsiders. Unfortunately, that did not deter one man, 26-year-old John Chow, from trying to visit and convert the tribe to Christianity in 2018. It's said that in October, he traveled on a tourist visa to Port Blair, the Andaman Islands regional capital, and took up residence in what he called a safe house. There, he assembled an initial contact response kit, picture cards for communication, bandages, dental forceps to remove arrows, and gifts like tweezers, cords, scissors, safety pins, and fish hooks. According to The Guardian, he carefully documented his activities in a handwritten diary. The resulting 13-page testament written with the earnestness and self-consciousness of someone who has digested many missionary and anthropologist accounts of indigenous contact and knew he might be writing for posterity recounts his final days in fascinating and tragic detail. Hoping it would lessen the risk of accidentally infecting the Sentinelese, he entered a self-imposed quarantine. For 11 days, he went without direct sunlight. He prayed, exercised, and read The Lives of the Three Mrs. Judsons, a 19th century missionary account. On the night of the 14th of November, he and some fishermen, Christians who had agreed to help, set out in darkness for North Sentinel, carefully avoiding Coast Guard vessels. Their journey was illuminated by glowing plankton, Chow wrote, and around them, fish jumped like darting mermaids. They reached North Sentinel late at night and anchored nearby. Other sources say that John Chow bribed locals, including the fishermen, to take him to the island so it may not have been, or only been, Christians agreeing to help him. It's said that they only pretended he was part of their fishing party to evade the patrolling teams of police, Coast Guard, and Navy. But continuing on. The next morning, 15th of November, he made his first approach. The fishermen refused to go any closer to the island, so he stripped to his underwear, he thought it would make the Sentinelese more at ease, the fishermen later said, and paddled a kayak toward the shore. He saw a hut and some dugout canoes. As he paddled up to the beach, several Sentinelese, faces painted yellow and speaking the language of high-pitched sounds, came rushing out. "'My name is John,' he shouted from his kayak. "'I love you and Jesus loves you.' When the islanders began stringing their bows, he panicked. He threw toward them some fish he had brought as a gift, then, according to his diary, turned and paddled like I never have in my life. Later that day, he made another attempt, this time landing on the island. He laid out more gifts, then approached the hut he was chased from earlier, straying out of arrow range. About half a dozen Sentinelese emerged and began to whoop and shout. He walked closer to try and hear what they were saying. He tried to parrot their words back at them and the Sentinelese burst out laughing. They were probably saying bad words or insulting me, he concluded. He sang worship songs and preached from Genesis. For a while, the Sentinelese seemed to tolerate his presence. Then a boy shot an arrow at him. 
the arrow struck the waterproof Bible he was holding. He pulled it out, gave it back to the boy and hastily retreated. The Sentinelese had taken his kayak, so he was forced to swim almost a mile back to the fishing boat. I'm scared, he wrote that night in his diary, watching the sunset and it's beautiful. He was crying a bit and wondered if it would be the last sunset I see before being in the place where the sun never sets. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, he wrote to his family, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Is this Satan's last stronghold, he asked God, a place where none have heard or even had a chance to hear your name. He decided he would make his next attempt without the fishing vessel floating nearby. Appearing alone might make the Sentinelese more comfortable, he thought. And if the approach went badly, this would spare the fishermen from having to bear witness to my death. His diary makes it clear that he didn't want to die, but accepted the possibility. I think I could be more useful alive, he wrote, but to you, God, I give all the glory of whatever happens. He asked God to forgive any of the people on this island who try to kill me, especially if they succeed. Shortly after dawn on the 16th of November, the last day he was seen alive, John Chow asked the fisherman to drop him off alone. He knew the risks, but the people of North Sentinel were damned and he was determined to save them. On November 17th, the fishermen saw a dead person being buried on the shore and they knew it was Chow. They told John Chow's friend and gave him the journal. Aerial surveys that attempted to find his body failed and word about John's death began to spread. One man who heard the news was Pandit, who said that he was surprised to hear about John's death. They only say, leave us alone. They warn, they are not hostile people. They don't raid their neighbors, he said. That much is true, they do warn. And the Sentinelese did warn John on numerous occasions. He got out of there with his life after an arrow hit his Bible. John may have seen that as a sign that he should go back, but frankly, I'd be more inclined to see it as a sign that screams, hey, you get one more shot, don't keep doing this and turn around. What's frankly really upsetting about all of this too is that All Nations, the evangelical organization that trained Chow, described him as a martyr. Mary Ho, the organization's leader, said that the privilege of sharing the gospel has often involved great cost. She called John's efforts sacrificial and told news organizations that he received 13 immunizations with the intent of protecting the Sentinelese people from infection, though Survival International has disputes that this would actually help. Chow's father, on the other hand, says he believes the American missionary community is culpable for his son's death. His father says he was an innocent child, as in naive from how I understood the context, who died from an extreme vision of Christianity. Some people have said he was a dumb American who thought the tribes needed Jesus when they clearly lived in harmony with God and nature for years. Others have called him a deluded idiot or a thrill seeker. I don't agree with their insults, nor with how all nations has viewed the situation either. Frankly, I do believe his father is right that John was reckless, yes, but he'd also been influenced by some extreme evangelical views. I understand that evangelicals want to spread the word of God and that's up to them and their faith and whatever, but that also means using common sense and accepting the consequences that follow. It's really a shame that John died for this because, well, I don't think the Sentinelese exactly heard that message or had any idea of what he was saying. In a letter left to the family, John said, don't retrieve my body. So those wishes it seems are being respected. And John did know what he was getting himself into when he went on this trip. I can't say how much of this was his decision alone or outside influences were involved, but it seems that John did understand that there was a large chance he was not going to return home. And that seems to be the case. If anything does destroy the Sentinelese, some speculate it will be global warming. As one journalist wrote, I wondered what the Sentinelese made of the coral die off and whether it made fish hard to find. I wondered if their streams had dried out in 1998 for on such a small island, the freshwater supply must be exceedingly fragile. I wondered if the monsoon came with uncommon violence, throwing down trees and crushed them and throwing up storm surges that washed them away. Scarcity of seafood and water, coupled with even more violent hurricanes as the earth heated up, would make the island unlivable long before the flood formally drowned it. In 2003, when El Nino again added its strength to global warming, temperatures would probably peak even higher. How would they cope? Now, I have no idea if the Sentinelese are thriving right now, how they're handling rising temperatures or getting food or anything, or how many of them are even, you know, vibing. But what I do know is stay the hell away from them. This is a little untouched corner of the globe right now. And while there are other uncontacted tribes elsewhere, the Sentinelese are widely considered the most isolated. While over time, many people have learned to simply stay away from them, many other tribes are likely scared and traumatized by the outside world. In the 60s and 70s, for example, Brazil largely viewed the Amazon as an empty place in need of development. 
Indigenous people were given little or no warning as their homes were bulldozed and some were just simply killed. Missionaries for years in the 70s and 80s have killed those that they're trying to save with disease until eventually people have simply chosen to not contact these isolated people at all. By contacting them, we risk killing them. And it's not as if you can tell one of these tribes to go seek medical treatment if they get sick, especially when they're not just going to trust outsiders that got them sick in the first place. I'm not saying there's no such thing as a future where we learn and communicate with the Sentinelese, but for now, I'm saying stay away from North Sentinel and leave that to anthropologists who can take things slowly and carefully. We don't need crazy Bible thumpers trying to attack and then eventually get killed. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the recent episodes. Thank you so much for making it to another video. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.